It is no secret that webcomics and animations are slowly becoming more and more mature. This has been seen in the cases of violence, language, and most importantly, complex character development. This is to say that the situations, interactions, and upbringings have become way more important in the long-term run of a series. One example that we've seen plenty of recently is characters coming to term with the trauma that they've received in the past. And An Ordinary is no exception. It's a fantastic comic written by Uruchan, and it's on Webtoon and it's free. There's only 240 chapters and I strongly recommend you read it. That may sound like a lot of chapters, but with how much this comic sucks you in, it goes by so fast. I would strongly recommend it, especially before watching this video. So, spoiler warning. When I started reading On Ordinary two years ago, I fell in love with a lot of things. I fell in love with the art style, the writing seemed really nice, and to be honest, it's a way better superpower society than My Hero Academia. No hate, it's, it's just the truth. And the characters! I loved every single character. They were fun and enjoyable and I thought they had fun interactions, but I never thought the story would go much deeper than that with character development. But my god, it got so intense so fast. Characters were dying, we dealt with grief and places in the social hierarchy, but most of all, John. My god. John, 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 John. Ugh. John is such a fantastic character, and he is so well written. Thank you, Uruchan, because he is incredible. He's the hero. He's the villain, but he's neither. He's angry at everyone, but no one. He seems well planned out, but unstable. It's, it's genius. But the most genius thing about him is not his ability... His abs, even though, oh my god, his abs are, oh, oh. No, the most impressive thing about him is his humanity. Yeah, he is probably one of the most human main characters I've read in a while. His story arc made me feel so many emotions at once. And you couldn't really identify what those feelings were until it came to the conclusion. Just a jumble of emotions all at once. Strong, intense feelings, but not sure if those feelings are right and you're second guessing yourself. This was the character that divided the community the most. Do we love him? Do we hate him? Do we understand him? Do we want him written out? Is he the villain or is he the unsung hero? He's neither. He's a person who's been broken. And I know we've gotten that several times. So many characters. In fact, the part of the script I'm reading off of right now, yes, this script right here, this 18 page script was going to be for trauma arcs for other characters in media because I enjoy this concept so much. And John was just gonna be a small little nugget. Just a small little, boop, there he is. And he's gone. Like, his, like an angel's kiss, he's gone. But writing that portion made me realize how much I loved John so much as a character. And there was no other way. I had to make a video specifically about him because he's such a perfect character. And I just want to break down everything that I love about him. I cannot stop gushing over this character and I want the world to know how grave a character he is. So please, for the last time, read Unordinary and behold what a great character John is. Please. Without further ado, Let's dive into why I love John so much. One vital piece to John's story, at least as a reader, is how weirdly his story was told. This comes from events not happening in chronological order. Like we would receive a bit of his teenage years at the beginning of the story as the main timeline's going on, but we would also receive like way younger things of himself way forward in the future. Time just worked really weird, not to mention there's ambiguity with some events with what happened, what was real, and what was altered. We'll get into that in just a second. So for simplicity's sake, I am just going to 
break down everything that we think is real in chronological order. So John's home life is very interesting. He had a powerless father, which unlike in My Hero Academia, this is very, very rare. As far as we know, he's the only one really without an ability. So that's a big deal. And from what we can assume from the story, John didn't have his mom at a very young age either. So basically, he had his crippled dad, who was probably a giant target for being a cripple, which really sucks and that's not good as a child. And this led to John thinking that he was a cripple. His ability didn't manifest when a majority of abilities do. So needless to say, he was picked on and bullied. He did manage to make a couple friends, however, Claire and Adrian. They were really good friends, but they were all bullied because of their low status within the school. Months later, John realized that he actually had an ability, but not necessarily one of his own. He had the ability to copy someone else's ability, not only that, but make it stronger. But I'm sure this is a weird ability to have. It's not one of your own. You're just copying someone else, not being who you are, but who someone else is. And like anyone who gets too much power way too quickly, it goes to his head. But can you really blame him? He's a kid. We all know what bullies were like back in school. They don't know any better. All they know is I have the power and they don't. And John has even better reason. That's how he was treated. So of course he's going to treat them the same way now that he has the power. And it spans outside of the school for the society. If you're not strong, then you're worthless. Everything in this society seems to be based around your ability. You could have a way better job than someone else, but is your ability a high level? Ah, I see. Hell, based on Sarah's parents, we can infer that ability, status, and wealth are pretty hand in hand. And since this is such a common teaching, what else was John going to do with his power? This is how he was taught, except for this other fatal part of society. Not only is it bad to be weak, it's bad to be strong. And this is something in real life too. The stronger that you are, the more fear you have. And I just didn't say that. Frickin' Mike Tyson says that. The strongest people fear the most. And that's because the pressure to stay on top is all on them. And when you're up in a high position of power, people talk about you. That's why you see famous people today can't have a social life. Or if they make one wrong step, then they're canceled for it. So they have to tread carefully. Because when you're at the top, all eyes are on you. And if they catch a chink in your armor, you're as good as done. So of course he was going to go psycho. He just went above than most kings of schools would. Because, again, this was a sudden growth in power. And he thought his actions were justified. So here he is at the top, just as a young kid with all the attention on him, which is also never good based on what we've seen. He's living on top now, finally no longer weak. People will finally love him, right? No. He may have gone too far, but he didn't think he was going that far. So what a fatal blow it was when his best friends rallied up everyone to take him down. He was down at the bottom before, but he built his way all the way up. And you're telling him that now he can't sit up there? Why? Because they don't like it? This was asinine to him, as it would be for a majority of us who are blinded with the power right in front of us. So, in his rage, he beat up all of his classmates. Yeah, that's pretty messed up, but as far as he's concerned, they fired the shots first. They beat him first. He got to the top fair and square. He used their methods. So why is he the monster when he does it? And the authorities. They see someone who's high-powered and out of control. Because someone high power threatens the power that they have. So they indoctrinate him into this rehabilitation program, which we see is absolutely brutal. Because Kion, 
aka the worst character in the series, I hate this man so much, gives this literal child PTSD and beats him. Like, we physically see that he beats him. So, that's something he carries with him for a long time. But, John being the trooper that he is, having his dad fully support him, he wants to start anew. In fact, he's so keen to start anew that he pretends like he doesn't have an ability again. He starts back off at square one. So what? He gets beaten. No one's looking at him with fear, and sure, being weak is bad, but being on top wasn't much better. At least he doesn't have to deal with the stress of keeping up appearances. He can be himself while being hated, instead of being on top and having everyone stare at you while still being hated. This is the best scenario for him, and I think he would have been fine wheezing by until he meets Sarah, someone who's at the literal top, probably one of the strongest people that anyone has ever seen. She's fast, her ability is so unique, perfect for combat in so many other situations. She's brought Wellston to the top, the top school has the top fighter. But John takes the risk to befriend her. He knows what it's like to be at the top. Even his short reign was hellish, so he knows that it's hell for her. And you know what? He's right. This world that they've built, based off of your ability, it's crushing for her. And she didn't think that anyone else would see that. But John, who's lived on both sides of the ladder, can tell you how crushing it is to be super weak or super strong. So why not forget your status and just live? And he becomes dependent on her. He didn't know that he would, and I don't think he ever realized how dependent he was. They did everything together. It's where he could be John. Not the cripple, not the king, and not the berserker. Just John. And that's where Sarah could be. Not the Queen of Walston, just Sarah. So, when Sarah has to leave him, he's lost. He has no one to confide in anymore. He's at the bottom, but he has no one to support him. He's lost in this endless wave of a society that cares so much about how strong you are. And John can't relate anywhere. He can't relate with the weaks, he's too strong, but he cannot relate with the strongs because, well, his strength hurts people, and he knows it. So he befriends Arlo, someone else who was at the top. John thinks that he can convert him as well because he understands how he feels being crushed at the top. And, to John's credit, he thinks it works. And why shouldn't he? Arlo seems not thrilled, but not angry with the situation, and even invites him to hang out. John has no reason to question his motives because they don't seem ill at all. But then, Arlo betrays him, and this kicks in John's PTSD. Not only the PTSD he got from last time, but the PTSD that was planted by Keen. Kind of figuratively and metaphorically, I guess. And this makes John snap. And for the second time, his trust was broken. And as far as he knew, he did nothing wrong this time. Genuinely did nothing wrong this time. He had that excuse last time, but here it was true. He played the cripple card, and yet Arlo attacked him. So this made John realize that, fine, even at the bottom, with no one acknowledging me, I'm still going to get hurt for no reason, even if I mind my business. And then he snaps. It slowly escalates. First, he only beats those who wrongs him. He still wants out of the limelight. And then... He wants to destroy the hierarchy completely, the thing that had brought him so much pain. If he ends it, all of his troubles will end, right? Not exactly. In doing so, he quickly becomes a part of the system again, becoming the conqueror that everyone fears again. He's at the top, again. He doesn't want it, but hey, this way, everyone leaves him alone. Even Sarah can't help him anymore. She's hurt by his betrayal like he was all those years ago. And John doesn't want to get hurt again. 
He doesn't think that there's any way to fix this, and his so-called friends have all betrayed him in the past. So he closes himself off, being content at the top. Or is he? That's when paranoia sets in. This paranoia again from being at the top. Being all the way up here, even if you say you don't care, you truly do. The paranoia starts eating him. What are the students saying about him? Are they forming a regime behind his back again? He's got to stop the papers from getting out and spreading negative words about him. Everyone's out to get him again. Why is everyone out to get him again? He played good and no one wanted that. He's at the top and he knows no one wants it, but at this rate, they'll leave him alone, right? Right? He goes crazy. It's eating him. He fights anyone who disagrees with him because he knows that the next step is obviously betrayal, right? That's what his patterning reasoning has taught him. He knows that if he lets them talk, they'll hurt him. But the talk isn't real. It's on his head. It's not the other people talking. It's himself talking. His fear is manifesting as other people. He's projecting his inner thoughts on everyone around him. They're all afraid of him, when in reality, they are, but they want to leave him alone. It's just that manifest in fear. Are the crowds whispering? They must be. It can't be me, right? But it is. It's just his inner thoughts eating at him. But realizing that doesn't fix the problem. So instead of him finding his cure, his cure finds him. Sarah. The one person he's always been able to depend on. She helps him literally through his darkest period. She offers the welcoming hand that he offered her, and he knows that it's genuine. At last, he's defeated again, but this time there's something different. He needs a break from the hierarchy, from this social status crap. He goes back to the one person he can feel on equal footing with, his dad, where he can be as powerless as he wants. So he goes back. And he meets some of his old friends. And, of course, it's painful. Seeing that will definitely trigger something with inside you. And then he realizes that some events he thought happened were just his worst fears nagging at him, and they never actually happened. He can't fix everything at once. But he makes small starting steps. And the best thing that he can do is acknowledge other people's wishes. As much as he wants to fix things between them, acknowledging them and leaving them alone is the best thing he can do for now. His mind is focused on recovery, and he knows that it won't be easy. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. John has found where he needs to go next, not up the social archy, or starting at the bottom and staying at the bottom. Just being himself. And I think that's something that we can all relate to. I sure know I can. A lot, actually. Listen, the story that I'm about to tell is deeply personal and kind of dark, so if you don't want to hear that, I completely understand. You can skip to the end of the video or just click off now, and I totally understand. But it's time that I stop running from this, and I need to address it and get it off my chest. Growing up, I was severely bullied. I grew up in a small town as the only African American, and I was a pretty big child. So I was the victim of many racial attacks and made fun of for being overweight. Um, my home life wasn't much better as I had a stepfather who expected too much from me, but there was no like personal connection between us. And that led me to be severely depressed and not really wanting to try anything. Eventually, I decided that I was done with being bullied, and I did what made me popular. I went out for a sport, I started working out, I started hanging out with some people I shouldn't have been hanging out with, 
did some really stupid things and things that I strongly regret. One of those things that I did was I bullied people. Anyone who I felt like I could have power over, I made fun of them. And in some regards, I think I went too far. I've said awful things about people who just didn't deserve it because I wanted to feel good about myself. And I did these things to appease other people. And finally, I thought I was happy. Until my sophomore year of high school. I had a quote-unquote relationship that, looking back, I, I feel like I forced that person into it. And I deeply regret it up to this point. After that, I realized that everything I built up to this point wasn't for me. It was to appease other people. And I don't know, and I didn't know what was for me and what was for other people. I didn't know what I was enjoying or what made me happy. I had a complete identity crisis. I felt like I was an imposter in someone else's skin, but I didn't know what I wanted. It was awful. I questioned everything. I questioned what did I enjoy? What did I force myself to do? I questioned my sexual identity and my gender identity. I questioned literally everything. And at that point, I locked myself away from everyone. I didn't talk at school, did nothing outside of school, rarely talked to my family, didn't even do anything on the internet. I would just sit and think. And I felt so lost. I don't know how, but I eventually learned to rebuild myself. I started hanging out with friends, focused on my inner emotions and the things that made me happy, and went for pursuing them. I did some acting, which I really enjoy and I still do to this day. I looked at more video production things, and that's what led me here. I love researching and putting together things like I am right now. And I enjoy the friends that I have now. And I don't think I'm dependent on them. For the longest time, I was strongly afraid what would happen once we graduated. I was afraid that everything that I rebuilt up to this point would disappear as everyone went off to do their own thing and I would feel left behind again. But as we've graduated, I know that I can hold myself together. I'm pretty sad that I may never see my friends again, but I have to keep hope that I will. And if I don't, I have to keep moving for myself. I'm doing things that make me happy. I'm working on projects so I can build skills because I genuinely enjoy learning these things. Things that I would have never tried if I still tried to be popular, if I still bullied people. And I remember the people that I bully and all the awful things that I did. And I feel like I don't deserve anything I have now. I feel like my friends are too good for me because of the shit I did. I constantly worry if I'm worthy of love and anything that comes my way. But they keep reminding me that everything I'm doing now is because I'm putting in the effort and I'm putting in the work. And I am just deserving as everyone else. And I've got to keep that in my head and make those thoughts my own. Because, like John, at the end of the day, we all deserve to be happy. And I believe that for everyone. So if you're in a down state right now, do the things that make you happy and move forward towards them. As long as they're legal and morally right, I don't care what you do. Just be the best you you can be. And if you see anyone else struggling... Give as much help as you can, because we're all struggling, and we all deserve to be happy. So, yeah. This was probably my most ambitious video and my longest. I really enjoyed making this, and I want to do more things like this, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm not going to ask you to like or subscribe, because... Given what we just talked about, that doesn't feel appropriate at all. So, as always, 
have a good day, and stay safe and be happy.